Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Christy York Wooten. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here to the Carter Center for tonight's conversations at the Carter Center. Tonight's conversation is called Standing Strong Against Attacks on Human Rights. Thank you for joining us tonight. We've got a great program for you, only an hour and 15 minutes to share. So I'm gonna skip the longer introductions and just tell you about the women to my left. We'll start at the far left. This is Memory Bandera. She's the Director of Programs and Administration at the East and Horn of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project. Next to her is Senator Hafida Ben Shahida of Algeria, a founding member of both the Algerian Women's and the Arab Women's Parliamentarian Networks. And next to me is Claudia Virginia Semayoa, founder of a protection network for human rights defenders in Guatemala. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. In your programs, you can read more about their important work, but we're gonna start. Um, before we dive in to today's topics, let me remind you to silence your cell phones, please. And feel free to keep them out if you would like to tweet. The, the hashtag tonight is Defend Human Rights. You can also submit your questions for the panel via Twitter using the hashtag or at Carter Center. Or if you're here in the audience with us, we have note cards. If you want to pass those to volunteers, and uh, at 7.30, they'll be around to collect your questions. So over the past few days at the Carter Center, dozens of activists and peace builders were in Atlanta to attend the annual Human Rights Defenders Forum. This year's theme, Building Solidarity Toward Equality for All, had a special resonance because we're facing a troubling geopolitical climate in which human rights and human dignity are under attack. The defenders had spirited and enlightening conversations about what solidarity means and how to strengthen and sustain networks and support systems for those fighting to bring human rights to all. One thing that emerged is that defending human rights can be lonely work. Defenders said that just knowing that there are others out there who believe as you do and who are rooting for you helps them have the strength to keep fighting. So just by being here tonight, you're showing your solidarity with these brave women and men, and we thank you for that. So I wanna get started by briefly going down the line here and asking each of you to please tell us what you've been up to, what your most recent work is, and kind of a one-line description of how you would describe yourself as a human rights defender. Claudia, would you like to start? Okay, very well. So, um, Oh, as, as I was told, I'm Claudia. I'm a Guatemalan human rights defender. I founded 20 years ago the Unit for Protection of Human Rights Defenders as basically a service to provide solidarity. So our idea in the general movement was basically to be there when someone else had been attacked. And for the last 20 years, I have been trying to figure out innovative ways to protect human rights defenders and prevent further attacks. Senator? Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Hafida from uh, Algeria. Uh, I started uh, working as, uh, uh, with the, with, in 2013, essentially, when we created the first caucus of women parliamentarians. Uh, although in Algeria we have had already a law that uh, uh, give women uh, presence in all elective bodies a minimum of 30%, but still with the United Nations uh, Women Organization, we created those networks in order to enhance the idea that women should be more active and the women should uh, uh, and, uh, require more equality, more participation in all the different structures, not only in the parliament, but also in the elected bodies, in municipalities, in the uh, province, and also uh, in the different uh, institution to access the decision-making level. This is what we have been doing, essentially. But also, I have another hat, and I'm a founding member of the uh, Mediterranean Women Mediators. We need that badly in our region. I'm thinking about uh, the, uh, not only North Africa, but many of the Middle East. And we have a lot of uh, conflict. And even in local conflict, not only the international one, 
We believe, and this is also one of the consequences of the United Nations Resolution 1325, that women should be present at all the levels of conflict resolution, starting from conversation, negotiation, mediation, uh, peace process, peace implementation, peacekeeping, etc. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Memory Bandera. I work with uh, the Eastern Horn of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project based in Uganda, and our work covers 11 countries within the sub-region. Our work is predominantly with human rights defenders, people who are on the forefront defending other people's rights. And the work that we do ensures that human rights defenders have practical tools to prevent threats to their lives, but also to stand with them when something happens to them and they need emergency protection. Then we come in and provide protection. And that can take different forms. Uh, depending on the nature of the situation, it can be medical support, it could be replacing their equipment so that they can continue to do their work. At times um, when the situation um, calls for relocation, we do relocation within the country from one region of the country to another. At times we do country-to-country uh, -country relocation. So really our work centers on the safety of human rights defenders. We have a no harm policy. We want to make sure that human rights defenders are able to do their work, but they can do it safely without threatening their lives. Thank you. So Claudia, I want to ask you specifically, can you tell us, uh, impunity is exemption from punishment or con consequence. So tell me how impunity plays a role in protecting human rights defenders. Well, so we all know that when we try to change our reality, we are confronting power. Either be a woman trying to stop domestic violence, we are trying to change the way men relate on the private uh, as, uh, context, as well as we can try to get our government accountable for corruption. So when we try to make the change, many times, most of the times, we can do it through dialogue. But what happens when you cannot use dialogue? Then usually you need to use remedy. Remedy is done through justice. Administrative process, legal, criminal process, there are several ways to achieve justice. But when human rights activists ask for justice in countries where there's intolerance, then uh, impunity is a factor. Then you cannot make things change. You try to hold accountable a mayor because he's stealing the money for the road and nothing happens. And then people retaliate against this human rights activist that is trying to use the remedy system. And what happens is that you get a reprisal threatened, uh, God will not, but killed. And then we need justice for the attacks that happens because we cannot get justice for the human rights violation. So that perverse circle ends up with more impunity in countries like mine, where the whole judiciary system is so compromised that corrupt actors make it work for them and not against them. And the worst part of this cycle is when the attacks against human rights activists or defenders, as we call it since 1998, cannot be stopped. And that fosters an, uh, a cycle of more and more violence. So for instance, I, we have assisted over 6,000 cases in Guatemala in the Unit for Protection. When I started this, this activity 20 years ago, I always say, I'm a philosopher. I really want to go back to my books. I'm doing this because I need to serve. I, I cannot stand this violence. But I hope I, I get out of work because punishment happens. Well, unfortunately, 20 years later, just this year, a 15 human rights defenders have been killed in Guatemala, but in my neighbor country, in Honduras, 
just in a little territory uh, where Afro-Caribbean indigenous people live, they have had 45 killings, 15 of them women, during the last two months. That happens where there's no sanction. Thank you very much. Hafida, I would like to come back to you again. And you mentioned the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 1325, which was about women, peace, and security. Can you go into a little more detail about how having women decision makers at all levels is important to your human rights work? Well, it started with the idea that uh, in conflicts, uh, you have always, in, a, in, reg in our region, I mean Africa mainly, you have had a lot of conflict. When the men goes to war, it's the woman that is the uh, breadwinner for the family, that uh, she is the one also that suffer much more. And my friend, uh, Memory, can tell us what is the, the worst that have Africa has been witnessing is in Eastern uh, Congo. Uh, women are abused, they are killed, and not only there, also we have seen that in, uh, in Syria more recently. So the implementation of this resolution uh, requires from all the states that are party to the resolution to submit every two years a report about its implementation. Many countries were asked also to have a national plan of action and uh, to, to stipulate very precisely what they are going to do. What we have done, uh, for example, in Algeria uh, was to uh, require a quota that is compulsory to all the institutions, even within the administration, and it has been also extended to a private company for corporation. So, and uh, it has been also extended in uh, more uh, secluded uh, uh, institutions like the army. Now, in Algeria, we have women uh, generals. We have eight of them. We have something like uh, 45 or 50 coronel, etc., women, uh, women uh, jet, uh, jet pilot, etc. But this is not enough uh, because there is always the imbalance between countryside and the city. So one of the main uh, work that we have to do is raising awareness, advocacy, and making also the local authority more accountable. Uh, the accountability of the local people is very important. And uh, to talk about what my, my friend uh, was, Claudia was telling us about violence against women, Algeria adopted uh, a law uh, in 2015. Uh, but no, it, the bill was passed in the lower house in 2015. But there was such an opposition from women lawmakers, women deputy that were against the law because they had that uh, religious uh, argument saying in the religion you have pardon, you have the forgiveness. So we don't want a law that is made by the human being to be against what is stipulated in the holy book or in the scriptures. And they opposed the, uh, the passing of that law. It, it has taken practically nine months until it was sent to the uh, upper house and to be adopted. And that also were, was giving, during that time, men, they felt stronger. There, there, there was impunity. You cannot uh, prosecute them uh, because the, uh, the argument was, oh, if we apply the law, then the, you are destroying the family. Then you are destroying the social fabric. And it has taken a lot of education, a lot of advocacy, a lot of campaign of awareness to make the people accept that. Mm -hmm. But also that it depends later on on the implementation, depend, uh, depend on the judges and the region where the judges are. Mm -hmm. Because there is always that difference between big cities, large cities, and the countryside and small town or remote areas where it's a, difficult to make them accept the, uh, the law of the state. Right, and the women decision makers. <laughs> uh, Memory, I wanted to ask you about your work protecting human rights defenders and what the difference is between the physical protection of the human rights activists and this new age of digital and virtual protection of their work. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, prevention for us is, is very critical. 
Um, just because we've been working on emergency protection for almost 15 years now, one of the things that we realized is that when human rights defenders have the right tools to use, they're able to actually prevent some of the threats that they would otherwise face. So one of the things that we do is to focus a lot uh, on security management, uh, specifically physical security. So we look at the work environment of the human rights defender and take them through uh, a risk assessment, how they can analyze the environment that they work in and what uh, protocols they can put in place to make sure that they can prevent uh, some of the threats that they face. But now a lot of people are organizing online and um, we also moved on to digital safety to make sure that when people are doing their work, um, if they're doing campaigns online, they take the necessary precautions uh, that they need to have for them to be able to uh, protect themselves during their work. Uh, but in the region where I come from, there's been um, a lot of um, office break-ins where people are actually trying to access information that human rights defenders are working with. And that was one of the things that prompted us to really focus on digital safety for human rights defenders. Because we have human rights defenders that are working on very sensitive information. People who are collecting um, documentation and evidence of human rights violations that are happening in different countries. In South Sudan, for example, in Burundi, um, in Sudan, all these atrocities that are happening there, people were trying to document and come up with um, really solid evidence that could be used, uh, for example, for future uh, prosecutions. And because um, they are keeping that information, people are trying to have access to that information, whether it's state actors or non-state actors, there are people that would want them not to keep that information. So as a result, we have uh, developed uh, a very strong uh, digital security program within our office that focuses on uh, protecting information, uh, but also on monitoring, documenting, and reporting human rights violations in a safe way. So we provide trainings and we do security audits for individuals and their organizations to make sure that the information that they are working with is safe and protected. And in Uganda, for example, we have trained um, quite a number of organizations and the last break-ins that happened, there was no information that was accessed because all the information was encrypted and it was backed up. So they did not lose information and their information was not accessed. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do to make sure that people uh, have a safe uh, storage of their information, but also their information is not being accessed. One of the most difficulties we've faced in the recent past is uh, victimization and stigmatization of women um, activists, especially when they are using online tools. So we've also been working with them to try and figure out how they can safely use um, online tools that does not put themselves at further harm when they do that. Great, thank you. So I have a question for each of you. This week's forum was called Building Solidarity. What does solidarity mean to each of you in the human rights context? Well, I think that the uh, uh, theme that resonated uh, in this table and all over the, the summit or the forum was uh, this idea that solidarity is the ability of being with. And I, as I told you, my service is a service that creates solidarity, that is founded in solidarity, in the sense that we not only, uh, we of course sign letters and petitions, but we craft the solidarity in a way that I take your issue with me. So if I really want to be in solidarity, for instance, with the women that are defending the territory, I, women human rights defenders from the city, that might not even know, understand what the territory the Mother Earth means for the indigenous, I'm able to take her or his plight with me and take the risk with the human rights defender. So for me, solidarity is that ethical commitment. So we don't need to go to the place, the physical place, but I need to be there. So we have the story of 
uh, they put a uh, state of siege in half of our country just one month and a half ago. And, in, and they uh, captured a woman human right defender, a peasant, that was defending her land. And they separated her from her little baby, which is illegal, by the way, but it doesn't matter in our country. That was an illegal detention. We mobilized. Everybody dropped whatever we were doing. Lawyers started having meetings to send to the local lawyer uh, arguments. We started calling. Everybody called whoever. They had to free her. It was one hour in jail. And it was because the whole local community of human rights defenders, including Congress women, were involved in trying to correct the wrong. For me, that is solidarity. It's not the whole time, but it's when you are needed. Thank you. Hafina, how about you? I'm not sure I'm in the same uh, vein of uh, thinking, because I would like to go back to our tradition and our, our policy, which has been the, the policy of my country and of many other African countries, that solidarity, maybe we too just took it for granted for a long time. We had that solidarity that was practically uh, untold, but it existed, with, uh, either with the neighbor in the uh, local uh, <clears throat> area or on the international level. We have been living through that as a, what we call between bracket progressist country, country that has uh, ideas that are founded on solidarity, on advancement, on against injustice, against apartheid. We started with apartheid long, long, long time ago. So the, the whole idea, it, it's not just the immediate solidarity with the person uh, that uh, you go and uh, demonstrate uh, uh, as a, to support, to show your support. Solidarity existed as part of the uh, daily behavior. The daily behavior is very strong. And it has been also nurtured with the political position of uh, the country that has been the position for the past uh, half century, let's say. And then with the changes in the uh, way of living and becoming, you know, more urbanized this society, people living in a small flat, which was not the uh, tradition. So there is different type of solidarity. You are solidarian with the people who are in your immediate neighborhood or within your political party or within your workplace. We don't have that issue of uh, human right defender it has not uh, that much existed. It exists, but we haven't had the killing. We haven't had any uh, deportation. Few detention people were detained are journalists, mainly. I know not a single case of human rights defender. Even if they are detained, it's, it's half a day, or they just uh, uh, go to the police station, and then they are released. because. There was no, no practically no case for uh, exactly what the, uh, my friend from Guatemala is telling us about Guatemala. We don't have that. We have had a very dif different process and evolution within the society, within the politics, because it's a country where uh, education is free until now, absolutely free. Uh, medical care is absolutely free for everyone. Housing is practically practically uh, free, it taken for granted, and there are so much subsidies for water, electricity, basic food, staple food, uh, oil, uh, petroleum, uh, books for studying, uh, free lunches in all the schools, and uh, so the evolution was quite different. It's not perfect, it's far from perfect, right. but the uh, process is quite different. And now, of course, we, have, we are living through a completely different period. But still, those basic elements right. are there. Thank you. And we, I cannot say that there are human rights defenders with a tribe or with a clan. It does not exist at all. Right. Thank you. Memory, what does solidarity mean to you? 
Uh, for me, solidarity is really standing with someone, being able to be there um, either physically um, or emotionally or in whatever way you can with another person or a group of people. Um, but also it means that you have to give a little bit of yourself in one way or the other. Um, because if you're standing in solidarity with someone, it means you have to learn about their issues, you understand their issues, um, and then you're there with them. So it means they're dealing maybe with an issue that you're not dealing with, um, but because you're not dealing with that issue doesn't mean that you can't stand with them. So there's a, a piece of you that you give in a way to stand with them. We've uh, seen different levels of solidarity uh, in, in our region. Um, I'll give an example in, in Kenya, for example, where we have had um, lawyers who have been killed as a result of their work, so a lot of extrajudicial killings in Kenya, and people just got on the streets. Everybody was on the streets and asking for justice. And they said, we want you to do investigations. We want you to tell us what's going on with these people. And I think to me that's, that's solidarity, being able to stand there with others, uh, regardless of what the issue is. And also it's important, I think, to mention that solidarity goes beyond the, the divides of the issues that we're working on. Um, so even it, whether I'm working on women's issues, land rights issues, whatever issue I'm working on, I think I take off that mask and come in to support as long as I'm supporting the right cause. Great. Claudio, back to you. I have a question about peace building. Can you give a specific story of peace building uh, that you've encountered in some of your work? Well, <laughs> maybe one. <laughs> I have so many stories. Well, as you know, we are a war torn society, survivors of genocide. Um, we had a case and a trial against the genocide perpetrator, actually two, it was repeated, and we got a national court to sentence the genocide perpetrator and declared that there was genocide, which accepting that there's genocide is a huge thing. And I remember very clearly um, trying to answer questions about oh, what a great work that lawyer did or that judge did. And the answer we all did, many people were involved. And I say, peace building is not the story of a single uh, hero. It's a story of thousands. So just when we see how did we get the, the sentence of genocide, I have to go back to the story of the widows that kept the stories of what happened to them. I have to go to the story of a man that carried the bones of his son in his back. And he did it until the Truth Commission. I have to story, tell the story of hundreds and thousands of people, including soldiers, that give, gave their testimony in the Truth Commission. And particularly, I have to tell the story of an 85-year-old man that lost his, uh, his uh, daughter was kidnapped, in force disappeared. And I had to protect him because there was some ideas of where the truth can be, and he had attacks. And I remember going to his house, talking to the family, because the rest of the kids didn't understand why he walked every day to the courts and submit again his request for her girl to appear. This is for more than 20 years. I found him uh, in, the, in the trial in 2013, and he was there. And he told me, I can stop walking on the streets because the work that these peasants did of indigenous people in a very far away countryside had gave me truth and justice. He will never find his, his daughter, but he had found justice. And 
I think that that collective effort, and uh, going back to solidarity, it also was the involvement of so many United States citizens that asked for a ban that was approved by President Carter and has been sustained in a bipartisan way. And it was conditioned to two things, to justice and genocide and to the teaching of the Truth Commission to the army. Since our army doesn't accept the truth, the ban is still on. So that is peace building, sustained vision, 30 years after the genocide. Thank you. Hafida, your country of Algeria is scheduled to have elections on December 12th. Can you talk about the peaceful protests that have been going on this year and what you have learned from them? Well, I, I don't know if the audience is uh, aware of it, but uh, it started early February this year in a small town called uh, Kharata in the eastern part of Algeria, where the citizen in that small town were, have seen hanging the uh, portrait of the former president. They went, they uh, tilled down the portrait. And they started the first uh, demonstration against the fifth mandate because the uh, political parties, the major political parties of what we call the government alliance uh, had had in, uh, in Algiers in the stadium invited as usual thousands of people and decided that uh, the uh, ailing president should be a uh, candidate for a fifth mandate. And that has spread immediately. And it started with the student in many cities, in the major cities of the coastline. And then it went on. And thanks God, or thanks to the wisdom, at the same time, wisdom of the demonstrators and the wisdom of the police or the army. Can you imagine that uh, every Friday, as from 10 a.m. in the morning until 5 p.m., you have um, an average of 8 to 10 million people demonstrating in the street. And I can show you thousands of videos, YouTube, pictures. And that was really the first thing that has surprised uh, Europe mainly, because we are next to Europe are so close to France, so immediately they poured in Algeria, all the journalists, the diplomats everywhere. This is a phenomenon, unexpected, unheard of. And now it's about uh, 40 weeks that still the demonstrations are going on. There have been uh, yesterday. Tuesday is the student, because they, the school work only on Tuesday morning. So they come and demonstrate. There haven't been one single person shot. And you can check with all the uh, media, the foreign media, the local media, the Arab media, the African media. This is just, it's not a miracle. There have been decisions on both sides. I don't know if they agreed, because I'm not aware of, of that secret. But on one side, the army and the police is not armed. They are present. There are a lot of cars, you know, those huge buses or what have you, the fourgons, the typical of, of the police, the dark blue ones. By the thousands, they are everywhere. You have the helicopters. There have not been one single shot, one bullet shot. There have not been one single glass broken. Not one, they tried at the beginning. Some people tried to steal the uh, mobile phone. But immediately there was an unbeliev unbelievable phenomenon. The youngsters around the street boys stopped the guy who was about to, to steal the phone. Tell him, no, 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 this is a peaceful demonstration. The end result of it, not the end result, the immediate result, after one month, the, uh, pre the former president resigned. They changed the government, and the constitution has been implemented. That is, the speaker of the upper house of the Senate has become the interim president. Then well, the demonstrations are going on, but you can easily imagine that when you have millions of people in the street, there is no interlocutor, not one person 
who is the leader, there is no leader. Because it has that kind of, uh, and really I'm very cautious, let's say anarchist, when you don't recognize the need to have a leader, everyone is equal. And the only thing that existed was that you have a corner for women, feminists, uh, with the, of course with all the uh, um, uh, demands for more equality because we still have, although we have the laws in Algeria that since the independence, there is a, a equal salary for equal job, there is no difference. We have all those laws that has been recently adopted that women can transfer and grant citizenship to the children, uh, the access to justice, the access uh, to education, the access, everything, except there's two things that are very uh, closely linked to religion. That is the testimony of a woman when you have a, a court, a case in court, or the inheritance, where still the, uh, the male inherit the double of uh, the female sisters. But there is also a provision in the law that if uh, the father or the mother want to distribute the, uh, the legacy, they can do it on equal basis. So even like for the polygamy, there is also the law that requires absolutely in front of the judge the agreement of the first spouse. So there are very seldom cases where one woman accepts to have a second one in the same family. Although, in spite of that, the feminist group are asking for more, which is absolutely legitimate. And then you have the corner for the student, corner for the journalist, and corner for the lawyers. And the lawyers are also extremely active. But there has not been a common platform. There have been several meetings. We have had one in June 15. There have been recently two other ones. And there is no common uh, agreement on anything. One thing is that to change the system, to change the uh, political class, which has been done. It has been done practically. We have a transitional government now. We have a transitional head of state. And the election are supposed to be held on December 12. And there are definitely two, two parties, one which is in favor of the election and the other, the demonstrator, uh, the demonstrator in general are against it. But now there is a new element in the equation, the economy. Yeah. Because of the oligarch, because the fight of the corruption has been very speedy, they have been very efficient, uh, although it's unbelievable <laughs> always. Sorry for using this uh, word all the time. But when you have practically all the... Uh, uh, Capitaine d'industrie, all the very rich guys who had all the uh, uh, industry and uh, the business and everything, the bankers, they are all in jail. So consequently, a lot of uh, companies, a lot of plants, of factories are closed down. Then we are facing the economic issue. And I don't think the people will accept to go through more uh, difficult time as far as economy is concerned and might be those people will join those who are in favor of an election so then we can have a legitimate government and a legitimate head of state. Right. We'll have to keep our eyes on that to see what happens. Memory, can you talk briefly about some of the inclusive models um, that you've been working on for protecting specific groups? Um, we've talked about the protection of women, but also including the LGBTI community, people living in conflict conflict or extraction zones, as you mentioned before. Just how, what are the nuances between protecting those different groups as human rights activists? We have different models for um, including people in different places. Uh, one of the things that we've been implementing over the years is to establish national coalitions for human rights defenders. And what that means is that we do have, um, we mobilize people within a specific country and have them come together and come up with protection mechanisms that will help them uh, protect each other uh, during times of crisis. 
And for us, um, as a criteria for us to create that, there are specific um, elements that we look at for inclusion. Um, there are specific groups that will have to be represented uh, as thematic groups uh, within that, and that's where we have the different uh, groups come in. So for example, women, uh, there has to be representation of women on the steering committee within that national coalition. So we have um, the main groups that we prioritize are women's groups. We have the LGBTI groups. We have people who are working on land issues, indigenous people, uh, people who are working on extractive industries. The other group is on elections. Uh, so human rights defenders that are working on elections or even journalists who are reporting on elections. So people who work uh, on good governance and elections are a priority group for us as well. And then we look at people who are working in conflict areas, um, especially in our region. Uh, we look at Somalia, um, South Sudan, Burundi, and we make sure that there is representation uh, of people in conflict areas. And then uh, the last group is uh, the group of people who are working on um, corruption issues. Uh, like Claudia says, uh, said, corruption is, is a major issue, uh, even in our region. And that's also um, one of the areas that we make sure that there is uh, proper representation, either journalists or human rights defenders that are working on those issues. So once we have um, thematic representation, we also look at the geographical setup of the country to make sure that all the regions of the country are equally represented. So the national coalition then has complete um, representation of different people. They don't have to agree um, on the issues that they are working on, but there has to be consensus of inclusion in that network. And for us to be able to support the network and to work with the network, that inclusion has to be there. So that's one model um, at the national level. We also have different models for uh, thematic um, networks where people come in for specific issues. Uh, a good example we had was in Uganda. Um, in, um, f from the time that the anti-homosexuality uh, bill was introduced in parliament, we created um, a, a network of different organizations, both LGBTI groups, but also mainstream organizations, to come in and look at the constitutionality of the issue and not um, just the LGBTI as an issue, but looking at it from a constitutional point of view. Um, so we came up with um, um, a, a solidarity movement to support that particular issue. Um, the issue went on and was um, approved in parliament, it was signed off by the president, and then went to court. It was challenged by the same group, and um, it was annulled uh, on a procedural basis. Um, as, as I speak today, there is, um, we've, we've had quite a bit of talk that there will be an introduction of a similar um, law in, in parliament. Um, it's going to be introduced as a private people's bill. And already there is mobilization around um, that issue to make sure that um, we have sufficient information on what kind of bill it's going to be, what kind of provisions are in that bill, and what can be done in terms of advocacy at different levels. So that's also uh, another form of um, network and providing some, fo some form of inclusiv inclusivity, but also solidarity. And then at the regional level, um, we have um, sub-regional networks covering different regions. So the one that I represent is within the Eastern Horn of Africa sub-region. We have one in Central Africa, in North Africa, in Southern Africa, and in West Africa. And these sub-regions are also formed on the same basis of making sure that there is inclusion of different groups of people and also uh, country representation. So if we, if we have, uh, for example, in our region we have 11 countries, we also have 11 representatives coming from each of the countries that we cover. And then we have thematic representatives covering the different thematic uh, groups that we prioritize. So that's what we've been doing uh, in terms of inclusion. It's not enough, there's more that can be done, uh, but that's one of the models that we've used. Great, thank you. 
So we do have some questions from the audience. Thank you for these. Several of you have noticed that it's an all women, all women panel tonight, so we're happy about that. And a couple of the questions are on that same topic. So this person wants to know, as a group of female human rights activists, are there specific challenges you have faced and how can we engage men more in the process of supporting or protecting women, human rights activists? So, um one of the challenges we face, or at least in my region, is the sexualized content of the, the aggressions, the attacks. So in my case, I suffered a huge defamation campaign, challenging the fact that I could talk truth. They call me a liar because all women are liars. So they attack your honorability, and as they attack you and your sexual integrity, I started receiving threats saying that they were going to rape me or rape my kids. And unfortunately, sure enough, my daughter, my youngest daughter, uh, they attempted to rape her. And they were telling her, this is because your mom does what you, she, do, you, she does. But there was another woman nearby and she saved my daughter. We didn't know, we don't know who she was. But uh, that solidarity between women in the street is so important. So that is something that comes one, uh, one and once again. Fortunately for me, my family supports me. But in many, many cases, the family can, is part of the attack. Because when you start having this sexualized component, your husband will believe it. And say, oh, you are slot. Or your parents will go and say, oh, you should just go back to your house, taking care of your kids because of that way they won't suffer. So uh, that's why we work a lot with protection networks, as, as uh, uh, Memory has said, miracle. <laughs> memory has said, uh, this is key for protecting human, uh, women human rights defenders because it's the solid solidarity between women the one that can support. And in many of these networks, they're men. And that's the change. The men is the one that has to help us stand to the face of the other men that are able to attack us uh, through the threat of rape or through rape or through our honor honorability. Thank you. I have another question here from the audience. It says, how would you recommend teaching current human rights issues to students of the middle school age level? That's probably from about 11 to 14 here in the United States. Um, beyond literature, would this, what type of approach would you suggest? I know we're not you know, all teachers here, but go ahead. Anyone who wants to add? Uh, teaching uh, human rights. It's fundamental, it's essential. Uh, I don't know if it does exist now in the curricula, but uh, uh, in our schools before, we had what we call in French education civique, mm -hmm. which is not only respect for the others, but uh, you are taught your rights, your duties, and I think it's part of the human right to start with. And of course, you can add to that what is done sometimes now, not everywhere, but it's done, that is teaching tolerance and accepting the other, accepting the other which is different, different race, different religion, different language, or even different region. Because uh, when you have a huge country, you can have uh, those kind of differences and uh, different uh, perception of the other because he, he, he speaks differently or he comes different, uh, from different region with different way of talking or uh, dressing up, etc. I believe it, it should be done and it should be done on uh, everywhere. Uh, and, and it should be one of the priority, one of the uh, uh, matter that should be taught. It's so important, otherwise we won't be facing all the conflict that we are facing nowadays. You know, uh, you can take it human rights not only on the uh, local level, 
but are on the international level. The moment you are not respecting the dignity, the sovereignty of others, of other country, you will have a conflict, the same as you have on local basis. Great, thank you. I'm going to throw this one in here too. Um, what can people in the audience do to strengthen networks be between human rights defenders around the world or even in their own communities? I think the first thing we're talking about solidarity. I think it's very, very important to stand with people that are working on different issues in different uh, parts of the country. Um, and oftentimes there are campaigns um, that different organizations run on specific individuals, on specific issues, and it's important um, to support those campaigns. The other thing that can be done is to encourage um, your government um, to speak to the governments um, in the countries where the violations are being um, committed. So if there's a place, if, if, for example, if in Uganda there is an issue that we're dealing with, um, we've often seen specific governments come out quite strongly and engage on those issues. And we've seen some progress um, on that front. So I think being able to sort of like push governments and including diplomatic missions to speak out on specific issues often helps. We, um, part of the, the job that we do is to um, do advocacy at different levels, at the regional level with the African Union, but also at the UN um, with the Human Rights Council. And those are very good platforms for airing out some of the issues uh, in some of the countries that we work in or in some of the regions that we're working in. So if there's a particular issue that is ongoing, um, it's always good to support um, that uh, country or that region by engagements at different levels. So if you have access to the Human Rights Council, being able to use that uh, to engage, if you have access uh, at different regional um, platforms, also using that to engage. We've also seen um, in some cases where uh, people actually do um, research and use social media to advance uh, certain issues. So that's also something that can be used. Um, we do uh, research um, specifically on human rights defenders. And if we're working on a specific issue and somebody wants to join us, we can also share some of our research and it can be used uh, for advocacy purposes. Thank you. Okay, here's another one from the audience. Um, some human rights terms are very generic with little meaning to the ordinary public. How would you suggest to measure or communicate these threats to the broader public? How would you say that we would talk about human rights in a more specific manner? Than, in, in other words, whether it's in your country through media, media reports or networks, how do you communicate the threats of hum, that human rights activists are facing to the general public in a, in a more simple manner? Well, I, I always say we, are, we tend all to be in some way defending human rights very easily. If something is going wrong in your community and you organize with your neighbor to get clean the streets, to uh, stop a delinquency or to ask the police to do their job, you are defending human rights. In, a, in our countries and in the United States, there is a myriad of examples of human rights plights. If you are asking for equality or liberty in a framework of tolerance, you are a human rights defender. And so it's going back to the basics, to the ethical commitments. It, so what I said is, in some countries, if you defend the right of Af uh, black people to live without fear of the police, you are a human rights defender. You might not call yourself like that. In the United States, you might be arrested like Jenny Fonda because she's sitting in the Capitol. Well, that also happens in our countries. But the difference is that here you get arrested and you give the fine and you can get out the same day or the day after. 
some cases is longer, but most of the cases are small. In our countries, you can be arrested for over three years in a filthy, overcrowded jail. The jails in the United States are overcrowded, but you don't have an idea of how many, many of our countries have jails. So we also suffer a criminalization, but it's different. Here, you might get some beating by the police, or uh, you get um, killings of young African Americans that was happening now in the United States. In some of our countries, the massacres happen during a demonstration. They, they massacre vill uh, complete vi uh, villages. So it's more a issue of a type of violence. But the general feeling or the general essence of intolerance, disrespect, is there. And you have also seen it. You have also heard certain precedent being intolerant to everybody that criticizes. But one thing is to have a Twitter president that will tell everything through Twitter. Another thing is having a president that will send you to be killed because you were a journalist that said things that couldn't be said, as happened in a, a, a Arabic royal family-led country. So um, it's very easy. We are. We can all be human rights defenders, or we can all be perpetrators. So it's a basically choosing for Thank tolerance you. and respect. May I add something to her? Mm -hmm. uh, to be more specific about uh, human rights, do we, or can we consider that economic rights, besides the right to health and to education and to freedom of expression and to freedom of uh, demonstration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Economic rights are very important. And if I'm not mistaken, it was at the United Nations in 1974 that one head of state uh, submitted the proposal that was the first charter, let's say, for the third world countries, talking about the terms of trade, because there is a global injustice vis-a-vis -vis the third world countries, where they are much more provider of uh, raw material that is sent in the industrial countries, and then the uh, third world countries have to buy the car or the uh, equipment or the machinery at a prohibitive, prohibitive price. And if I'm not mistaken, if you apply that uh, charter. I don't know if, uh, what was the, the lot of that charter, if it has been or not, but I remember perfectly that it was on the terms of trade that it has been proposed. And since then, there have been so many things, globalization, WTO, what have you. And I, if, if it were implemented, we would have had less conflicts because one thing is to respect the country one thing is to have a just price for the uh, uh, primary commodities or the uh, raw material that come from third world countries. And one of the consequences that we have been witnessing, and I'm thinking only about Africa, is the, uh, the uh, people are terribly poor and sitting over land that is terribly rich. It is scandalous. I don't know. It is outrageously rich. Uh, soil with people outrageously poor, and this has to do also with their rights to be to have a dignified life or a respected for life. And that dovetails with this next question from the audience: um, How can human rights defenders and organizations better utilize international treaty bodies as a tool in their fight? So treaties between countries, for example, which would apply to yeah. oh, your definitely. economic rights. But the, the issue with treaties depends on the, uh, the will of the uh, current government, because we have seen many cases, and I'm not going to give you the examples, where treaties have been signed when people are party to international convention. One of the most striking examples is the COP21 about climate change that was signed in Paris a few years ago. And that also has to do with the human right, because one of the rights is to have 
clean air, clean water, to have a, a planet there where, where you can live, still live. So the, 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 the COP21 convention at, were not that demanding. You know what they were demanding? At least the minimum to survive, an, an increase of less than one uh, degree in the uh, climate change. And it has not been implemented. And there are people who decided to quit the convention. Yes. You know them. And there are people who are not implementing it. And they are, uh, what is going on in Brazil is a crime against humanity. And this is the uh, burning of the uh, forest of the Amazonian forest. The destruction of the uh, uh, biodiversity is for me, I consider that a real crime against humanity and against human rights. Thank you. Memory, this is a good one for you. Besides technology, in what ways is hu are human rights, or is this human rights work different between generations? Have you noticed um, how maybe people who were fighting for human rights and civil rights in the 1960s may be different from millennials who are working today? Mm, in, very good question. Yes. <laughs> um, I think the, the basics are the same really. People are fighting for the same uh, issues, more or less. And what we've noticed in our region is um, a new wave of people who are fighting for their rights when it comes to extractives. We've, um, we have um, most countries that have uh, discovered uh, resources in mineable quantities. So it means that uh, there's a lot of interest uh, by a lot of countries, but also multinational uh, companies coming in to invest uh, in our countries. Mm -hmm. And we have seen some young people really taking the lead on that fight to be on the forefront um, to uh, fight for, uh, for, for land rights, um, but also for um, equ equality in terms of the, the contracts uh, that are being signed. We've also seen um, quite a number of people asking for transparency in, in terms of the agreements that are being signed from their own governments. So requesting governments to be transparent in terms of who they are signing the contracts to and that process, how that process uh, pans out. Um, so that's one of the, the areas. But I also, um, a lot of the, uh, the activism has really been online. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a generation of young people who are also taking to the streets. Mm -hmm. Um, and becoming very, very active on specific issues uh, that concern them. Uh, and like I said, um, ex extractives is one of them. But you also have women who are forming uh, stronger and stronger uh, networks and um, coming together and speaking about specific issues, and spe especially girls. Um, I've seen uh, quite a number of um, girls-led organizations where they are coming up and um, uh, really, sort of like they're really on the forefront of, of the fight of against, especially against sexual violence, against specific issues that affect them directly. We've also seen campaigns on education, especially girls coming up and saying that we have the right to education, we need to go to school. So I think as much as we have uh, online presence, uh, there is still quite a lot of activism that is happening even physically within different countries. Can you, oh, go ahead. Let me add, there's another characteristic, and the ability to understand the interdependency oh, and integrality of rights. Because we come from a generation, it's until 1995, that in Vienna, there was the acceptance of the interdependency. We make an effort to link them I, in either side of the spectrum we are. But for young people, they had it very clear, the linkage between the right of, of a good living with the right to uh, live without corruption to the li right of environmental rights and, and women rights. And they can embrace the issues. And I think that's another very important change. Mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to ask is President Carter, who was with you all yesterday at the forum, talked about taking bold steps to connect and protect human rights defenders. So this connection element is important there. 
can, can each of you answer what is the boldest step you have taken or would like to take as far as connecting uh, or building those networks with other human rights defenders? Boldest. <laughs> <laughs> well, they may all be very bold. <laughs> I will say, I think the boldest step I have taken is to accept the challenge to work with human rights defenders in other parts of the world. But I don't go to the capitals. I go to a community uh, in the Amazonia or uh, to a community in Chihuahua or with migrants that have no land uh, and try to learn with them the best processes to find the methodology to protect. Because I think that that's much more harder to do than coming to Washington and meeting the deputy of the CIA to talk about ending the impunity in Guatemala. It's way more harder. You want to answer the bold? <laughs> Who wants to be bold next? <laughs> I think in the work that we do, um, because we are on the ground, we are in the countries that we work in, um, being able to have conversations and do advocacy with um, different um, um, countries, or at least dialogue with different countries, representatives from different countries, um, is, is something that is a bit of a risk even on our part. Um, just being able to sort of like tell governments that this is what's going on in your country and these are the areas where you need to change. Um, that has been um, really a bold step for us. Uh, in some cases, we try as much as possible to come together with other organizations so that we have one voice and it's not just us speaking on a specific issue on, on a specific country. So I think that's one of the things that we've done, but we're not stopping doing that because then it's very critical, especially for the human rights defenders on the ground. They need that voice, they need us to be able to speak out and to point out when something wrong is happening. Uh, yesterday I gave an example of uh, Tanzania where we were able to do uh, research over one year and found out that there was a lot that was going on um, in, in terms of violations against journalists, um, media people in general, um, parliamentarians, anyone who was speaking out against the government. There was a lot of backlash going on. And people didn't know about this, uh, partly because most of the news is in Swahili, but also because there wasn't a lot of coverage on what was happening in the country. And when we finally spoke out and brought out these issues, um, there was direct um, attack on us as an organization because we're bringing up these issues, um, but also it steered discussions in the parliament in Tanzania. So it meant that they knew that people are watching, people are listening, and they needed to do something about it. So it created that debate in the country. So that's why I say it, it, it's one of those difficult uh, things that we do, but which is essential, especially for the human rights defenders. And maybe the other thing I can bring out is um, in the work that we do, we work a lot with human rights defenders that end up being displaced from their homes, from their countries, um, and move from one country to another. And we have the issue of transnational threats where human rights defenders have sought refugee in one country and they think that they're safe, but then they continue to receive threats in that other country. And that's really a big issue. Um, we've tried to set up um, safe cities where we can relocate human rights defenders in a city where the mayor of the city, uh, the government of the day, and a university and human rights organizations come together and say we want to make this a safe city. And when human rights defenders come into our city, we are going to provide the protection that they need. So that's something that we've started doing and that's something that we would definitely want to see happen in many of the countries uh, in our continent. I would like to add just something and I fully agree with uh, memory. Uh, to help human rights defenders or to help people who have been having a problem, we have had a problem with people coming down from the hideout, from the mountain, the cold, during the terrorist uh, decade. You have some people who were there in spite of their will. You have people who have just been 
uh, dragged by the terrorists because of the family link only. But the moment there was a sort of, I'm not saying amnesty, there was reconciliation, concord, different laws and referendum in Algeria, so that the people who were not part of the terrorist war would accept that the other come back. So you cannot do that in the limelight or boast about it. One has to be extremely discreet, even for the human rights defender, because you can put them in danger. So one thing is to be discreet. The other thing, for instance, like uh, Memory was saying, was to relocate them. We don't call that safe city, but uh, people who, in spite of their will, were involved in the hideout with the terrorists or were not part in, uh, let's say, in, uh, uh, killings, etc. So they were located in villages away from their village of origin so that they won't be uh, stigmatized or there won't be the revenge or they won't be killed. So there are lots of human factors and details that has to be into account and things are never very simple nor very clear and to take a bold step I would think twice about it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for each of you for being here, and thank you to the Carter Center for having us. Um, I hope you'll join us on January 14th for a conversation focused on Atlanta's role in the global mental health resolution, and on February 27th on Tunisia, the best hope of the Arab Spring. You'll find out more details about each of these events online. Thanks again to all of you for being with us tonight, and please join me in a round of Applause for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.